Hello, and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast, and this is 10 Questions, Greek War and Politics. We're going to do the three stages of the Persian Wars, Peloponnesian Wars, and then Alexander's Wars. So, if the phalanx infantry equaled oligarchy and assemblies, like we talked about in our last podcast in our last episode how do we get democracy and why well navies equal democracies this is at least what aristotle tells us and it makes sense once you go into what the navy is in this time period the first is it's rare it's expensive ships are very very expensive only the richest people can afford them and they require a lot of manpower. Why? Because the trireme is a warship of the day. The trireme required 200 oarmen to row it. And they could get up to like 10, 12 knots. I mean, they could get pretty fast. But the winds of the Eastern Mediterranean, you couldn't rely upon in battle. And so you used, you had to have rowers. And at the front of this ship was a ram. And so a trireme essentially fought like a phalanx at sea. It came in at a run. It smashed into an opposing ship, preferably from the side. It backed up, which you can do if you have rowers. You can't do that if you are, only have sails. It backed up and it rammed it again, which would then swamp the ship as water came in and the men would have to abandon ship or be, be stuck there uh, onto the floating debris. So how does this equal to a democracy? Well, Athens, who's going to be the first democratic society in Greece, had 300 ships. Those 300 ships each required 200 men. Those 300 ships times 200 men equals 60,000 rowers. You couldn't get 60,000 rowers just from the middle class. You couldn't get 60,000 rowers just from the rich people. If you want 60,000 rowers, you need to employ the poor. You need to employ people who are day laborers, who are working for the middle class people. You need to employ everybody. Most cities don't have 60,000 men. And then there's this, and this is important. Who are these men going to be? They're going to be young men. What are they going to do for four months out of the year? Well, they're going to row seven days a week, eight hours a day. What do you think these guys are going to look like when they get off the boats in September. They're going to be jacked. They're going to look like the Egyptian workers who just finished working on the pyramids. They're going to be ripped. All they're doing is uh, hard cardio, right? Resistance weights, eating a high-protein, low-fat, low-carb diet, right? So they're going to be jacked. They're going to be ripped young men from 25 to 40. They're going to have money in their pocket because you're going to have to pay them because they can't work for those four months. So they have confidence because of what they look like, who they are, and they're going to want to have a say. And there's 60,000 of them getting off the boats every September. Anyone can row. You didn't have to have you didn't have to be middle class you didn't have to buy your own oar and if, if you did anybody could have effectively afford that unlike the shield and the armor of the phalanx and so anyone can row which now means you have a democracy because it include it can include all levels of man all classes and economic status but also it's so many that that oligarchy is now overwhelmed and what the assembly basically says is, we're going to run the show. 
We are going to make our own decisions. The assembly is going to choose its leaders. The assembly is going to choose its uh, its taxes. The assembly is going to choose how the state spends the money. It's not that we're going to answer yes or no to questions the oligarchs give us. No, 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 no. We will elect our own leaders. And we will decide the rules ourselves. The assembly runs itself. It's like a class choosing its own tests. See, in our class, I make the schedule. I make the lectures. I make the tests. I make uh, the questions on the test. And if there's a big question, I'll ask your opinion. Can we postpone the test? What do you think? It's scheduled for this day. I chose this day. But I'd like to postpone it, right? We have five questions, five essay questions on the test. Uh, what do you think if I, well, if I only made it four questions? That's the oligarch, me. I'm in charge. But I'm asking you your opinion on stuff, the assembly. That's not a democracy. A democracy chooses its own teacher. A democracy chooses its own test. Okay, we have to have grades. We have to have grades. So we need a test. We need tests, right? How many tests do we have? Uh, 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 20, uh, 3, uh, 12. How about one? Oh, we could have one. How about, okay, okay, it's on the floor. Who wants just one test? Woo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the one test passes. All right. What's going to be on that test? Oh, uh, yeah, well, 100 questions. Uh, you have to write a book. Uh, it's a research project. Uh, how about one true false question and we know what the question is ahead of time? Like, does the sun rise in the morning? Ooh, ooh, I like that. Okay, so uh, let's vote. How many of you want to have uh, 100 questions? No. How many of you want to have an essay, a research paper? No. Uh, how many of you want to have one true false question and the question is, does the sun rise in the morning? Yes. All right, that's what we're going to do. That's how, it, that's how a democracy runs. It runs itself. It chooses itself. So we start to get democratic, democratic governments in Greece, especially at Athens, because of this reliance on navies. At least that's what Aristotle will tell us. So, which is why the, the Spartans never really have a good navy. They never really make one. They're not a naval people. Uh, and we'll talk about that. That will pop up later. But they will have the best infantry in the entire Greek world. But in terms of navies, they get seasick looking at a rubber ducky bobbing up and down in a bathtub. So what were the Persian Wars? Well, the Persian Wars are a series of conflicts from 500 to 460 or so BC between the Persian Empire and a small number of Greek cities. Now, not all the Greeks... A small number of Greek cities, especially Sparta and Athens. If you're looking at the video, it is this. All the orange, which is like 3,000 miles across versus the circle, versus the little green circle, about 13 Greek cities. How did the Greeks win the Persian Wars? That's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that because that was Herodotus's question. That is the question that invented history. And his answer was the Greeks were free and the Persians were not. Now, to answer that question, to prove it to be correct, Herodotus had to go on a world tour, do lots of interviews, do archival research for as good as archives were back then, and wrote 900 pages in order to prove his thesis. What does this show? This show that history is not a chronicle. History is a, not a list of events. History is a scientific analysis of people, events, of causes, of ramifications. It's not just stuff that happened. It's not names and dates. It's not memorization. It's why. It is a scientific analysis of people. So the answer, the Greeks are free and the Persians are not. What does he have to do? He has to, one, prove the Greeks are free. Two, he has to prove the Persians are not. Then he has to 
prove that freedom mattered in warfare in general, and then that freedom matters in the Persian Wars in particular. He has to do all those, those four things. That's not just this happened, then this happened, then this happened. This is an analysis of the people, the places, the stuff, the events, the motivations, the uh, philosophies, the psychologies, the sociologies. So if you're wondering how did 13 little cities defeat the greatest empire in the world, that's a great question. It's the first question of history. What are the results of the Persian Wars? Well, obviously, the Persians lose, so we know that. Um, Sparta is traumatized by the defeat, by their defeat at Thermopylae. The Spartans were the leading state of Greece, and so when the wars against the Persians happened, the Spartans took over the leadership role. These, these little cities went to Sparta and said, you run the show. Even Athens was like, we're cool, you run the show, you're the Spartans, you're in charge. You tell us what to do. And the Spartans decided to fight at Thermopylae, this very narrow point uh, of entrance between northern Greece and central Greece. And instead of holding out for three months, they held out for three days. Their king was killed. Leonidas is killed at the battle. It's this dramatic stand that Herodotus tells us about. But the effect of this is that the Persians are traumatized. They lost. And they're going to turn inward. But they're going to maintain their slaveholding. They're going to maintain their militarized society, both of which were weird to the Greeks. Now, the Greeks had slaves, but Greeks did not keep large numbers of fellow Greeks as slaves. The Spartans turned an entire neighboring city, which outnumbered them at least three to one, though uh, I think it's... Um, it might be Herodotus, but it might also be Thucydides, who says it's 10 to 1, it's 9 to 1, which is debatable because numbers in the ancient world are always debatable. They're, they're, they're large to prove a point. Uh, but the point was is that they're outnumbered by their own slaves. And so to maintain slavery, the Spartans militarized their society, which to everybody was weird. The Spartans aren't really Greek. The Spartans are Spartan because they don't really, they rarely worship Greek gods and they speak Greek. They act, and I'm going to go through a whole list of things that nobody else acts like. So if you tell me the Greeks acted like and then give me a Spartan thing, I'm going to say, no, the Greeks did not act like that. The Spartans did, but nobody else did. So like the boys and girls are separated at the age of seven into barracks. Boys and girls grew up separately from each other. The girls were taught how to both be a wife, but also how to fight, how to war, and economics. They had to have a level of independence while men were away. Boys were going to learn how to fight, how to be physically fit, how to have a hot body, how to have a strong body, but they were also encouraged to have homosexual relationships. They didn't even get married to the age of 27. Married to a, to a girl. So from the age of 13 to 27, they mostly had homosexual relationships. And it was encouraged. Why? Because the phalanx stays together. They don't run. And everything, everything the Spartans do is to create a phalanx that doesn't run. And Thermopylae proves that. The Spartans don't run. You want to defeat a Spartan army? You have to kill every last one of them. It's not that the Spartans don't lose. The Spartans lose. But you have to kill them. It's something like when they finally run away after at one of the battles, Lucretia, it's one of the battles. It's like the first time the Spartans had run away in 700 years. Like they just don't run. And part of that was they put homosexual male lovers next to each other. Now, ultimately, those men will marry women at the age of 27, but that didn't end their bonds with each other. Girls, in fact, cut their hair at marriage to look more like boys to make themselves more presentable to their husbands, or at least less scary to their husbands. In fact, men did not cut their hair. The, the, the Spartans are famous for this long, luxurious black locks that go all the way down past their shoulders. 
It's funny that in the movie The Three Hundred, the guys are all they all have these modern marine haircuts. When the when the Greeks, the, the Greeks didn't do this. They had you know black curly hair, but the Spartans would would rub would do their hair like they were in a Vogue model shoot. They had this long, luxurious hair that any you know guys today, the manly men today, would call them like, "What are you gay?" and they would beat the snot out of that guy. So the gender fluidity here is big for a people who are very militarized. Everything about their lives was about the, about war. Marriage was not about love. Marriage was paired for genetic engineering. And, you know, you understand, this is simple genetic engineering. Uh, you take the fastest boy and the fastest girl, you hook them up, and the hope is you have super fast children. You take the strongest boy and the strongest girl, you hook them up, they make super strong children. It was like, it's how you breed horses. Uh, so marriage was not about love. It was not about romantics. It was about generating, genetically engineering, even though they didn't know genetics at the time. But it was about creating a super race of warriors. The point was to create a phalanx that never ran away, and that worked. If you were going to defeat the Spartans, you had to murder them all. You had to kill every last one of them. What's the second result of the Persian Wars? Well, the second one, if Sparta was traumatized, Athens becomes a great power. Athens has confidence from defeating the Persians twice at Marathon, which was a land battle in 490 BC, and then at Salamis, which was a sea battle during the Persian invasion of 480 so they did something nobody else had done up to that point, and then they did it again. So they have this confidence of we can do anything. The Egyptians didn't be defeat the Persians, the Babylonians didn't, the Lydians didn't. We did. And so people come to them and say, Athens, Athens, protect us. And the Athenians say, of course we will protect you. And that's the Delian League. The Delian League is this alliance led by Athens of Greek cities who are going to protect, who are going to pay Athens for protection from Persia. If the Persians ever come back, the Athenians will protect them. So what we have is the cities along the coast of Ionia that used to be owned until 460 by the Persians. It's going to be the islands that were also owned or worried about the Persian fleet. It's going to be other parts of Europe Southeastern Europe, that the Persians used to own. And it works like insurance. The Athenians promise that if the Persians ever show up, they will have your back, and you pay them. And it wasn't that much. It was a, it was, it was a fair sum. It was a negotiated sum. And the money comes flowing into Athens. Because, remember, for the people, for the other cities who are paying Athens... It was cheaper than having to build their own navy, which also meant maybe ending up with a democracy that the rich people didn't really want. So, you know, the Athenians have a democracy. Let them go do it. Pay them. They'll protect you. And you could, keep, you could stay in charge and not have to worry about giving voting rights to your own people. Right? So it works out. Everybody's happy. It works like insurance. Money flows into Athens. So what's the result of the Delian League for Athens? Athens becomes the leading state of Greece. With that money, they're able to build and rebuild and keep their fleet. They get a democracy. They reinforce that democracy. And the democracy will always vote money to keep the fleet, to maintain the fleet, to improve the fleet. Men voted their laws. Men voted their government. Men voted their leaders. Really, for the first time, really anywhere, you had mass participation in government. They also were the leading military state in Greece. They will invade Egypt to try to free the Egyptians from the Persians. It doesn't work, but the Spartans didn't do it. The Athenians do. They will build great buildings. The Acropolis will be rebuilt and rebuilt better than before. The Agora will be expanded. Culture, education, poetry, plays, all are going to be invested in. All are going to be bought. 
Athens becomes what was called the, quote, school of Greece. If you've ever been through uh, Epcot's spaceship Earth, the big ball, this is the scene where you see the play going on in Greek and the philosophers. This is that time period. It's a time of culture, education, poetry in place, but also a time of great building and engineering and also a time that they are the leading military state in Greece. So everything turned out great for Greece after the Persian Wars, right? Everything was fine? No, silly. <laughs> it didn't work out well. It turns out to be terrible. Why? Well, Persia did not reinvade, as everybody expected. So cities stopped wanting to pay the insurance. They eventually said, hey, we're not going to be reinvaded, so why should we pay? But Athens liked the money. And so it wants these cities to keep paying. And so they turned the Delian League into the mafia, into the Athenian Empire. See, in the Delian League, you paid Athens to protect you from, Spar from Sparta. In the Delian League, in the Delian League, you paid Athens to protect you from Persia. In the Athenian Empire, you paid Athens to protect you from Athens. You didn't have a choice anymore whether or not you were going to pay. And they dominated the small cities, the small islands. They dominated Ionia with its, with its trade to the Persian Empire. And this scared every other large city, Corinth and Thebes, for example, who need their own protector. They are worried that the crocodile that's in the lake that is Athens will eventually gobble them up. And so they turn to the Spartans and they go, you're the toughest guys in Greece. You used to run the show. You were, you don't like the Athenians because they pushed you out of the way, out of your leadership role. Protect us from Athens. And so what you ended up with are these two groups, Athens and a few of their friends, plus all those cities that paid Athens, whether they wanted to or not, versus Sparta and the other big cities that were afraid of Athens. And what was the Peloponnesian War? The Peloponnesian War was when those two groups went to war when those two groups fell into conflict. It's a massive conflict lasting 30 years. It's between Athens and its fleet, though it has a good phalanx army. The phalanx army is still not as good as the Spartans, but especially its fleet and the money from its empire and a few friends like Plataea versus Sparta and its allies, who weren't really allies, they just didn't like Athens. The only thing that, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Sparta and its frenemies, who were scared of Athens, would gobble them up next. And the conflict was trying to answer the question of who would control Greece. Independent cities led by a conservative, slaveholding, not very Greek-like militarized state? Or a commercial, democratic, culturally sophisticated, and cosmopolitan super city. Would the cities of Greece be dominated by a conservative oligarchy of major cities that, for the most part, let everyone do what they wanted to do, but would every once in a while boss them around? Or by this commercial super city that, well, it told you what to do, at least bought your stuff. It bought your stuff, it made you rich, it, in, it gave democracy to your farmers. And then it educated your citizens. So, who's going to control Greece? Well, what are the results of the Peloponnesian War for Sparta? Well, Sparta won. Congratulations, they won. They put together the coalition that defeated Plataea, Athens' ally. They fought for the, quote, freedom of the Greeks, even though they owned a large number of Greek slaves, known as the Helots, the Helots, and they allied with Persia, the great enemy, to eventually smash the Athenian navy and in 404 conquered Athens. They did all of these things and got away with it, even though 
conquering other small cities is pretty bad. Fighting for freedom of the Greeks while owning slaves is at least hypocritical, if not worse. And allying with Persia and then selling the Ionians out into slavery, because that's what the Persians want for their help, in order to defeat Athens, a fellow Greek city, it, it, they got away with it. They won. It was hard. It was bloody. It was difficult. But the Spartans led this coalition that defeated the hated imperial Athens. They returned to being the leading state of Greece. Congratulations, Sparta. They did it. So what are the results of the Peloponnesian War for Athens? Well, Athens lost. And they need to explain why they lost, and that's going to be Thucydides' military history of the Peloponnesian War. If Herodotus invents history, Thucydides invents military history. He's going to take the thesis notion of Herodotus, even though Herodotus is talking about war, Thucydides is really going to talk about how, how it's, it's and my, my dissertation goes back more to Thucydides than to Herodotus. The father of my of military history is, Thura, is Thucydides, while the grandfather of history is Herodotus. And he's trying to understand why Athens is going to lose, why Athens is losing. And the answer for him was after Pericles, the great leader, the great democratic leader who died in the third year of the war, the, the leaders who came after him were weak populists who played to the voting wants of the dumb demos, the dumb Democrats, of the dumb uh, mob of people. They said, we're going to win easy, and it's not going to cost you a thing. And the people said, yay, what do we need to do? So Athens democratically decided to commit genocide at Milos. Democratically, the, the, it's important to understand that this genocide was not uh, evil. It was not dictatorial. It was not um, um, a bunch of racist madmen who uh, had crazy Darwinian theories about uh, gender or race or species. No, it was democratically argued, democratically voted on, democratically decided to commit a, to commit genocide, to wipe out a city, a Greek city of Milos. If the Athenians could vote to commit a genocide, anybody can commit a genocide. Anybody could commit war crimes. There is no civilization on earth that is that war crimes are impossible to do, no matter how democratic you are, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how much you believe in, in freedom. The Athenians democratically voted to commit a genocide. That caused the hatred of other Greeks, because other Greeks looked at them and went, oh my God, if the Athenians conquer us, what, are they going to murder all of us too? So, so the Athenians actually lost a lot of support after committing a genocide. It was supposed to terrorize everybody. And what it made was everybody fight harder, because they were worried that they would be the next one to be obliterated. Plus, their navy, which had been the source of so much wealth, of so much industrialization, and so much trade, the navy was smashed by the Spartan-Persian alliance. So you didn't have a navy anymore. So that's the end of the commercial empire. And with the conquest of Athens in 404, the end of the only pure democratic government the world has ever known. Remember, we are not a democracy, ladies and gentlemen. The United States is not a democracy. We are a republic. We are the Romans. We are not Athens. The founding fathers didn't want, looked at Athens and said, that place is insane. We don't want our government anywhere near democratic Athens. So we call it democratic, but it's not. You don't vote for anything except your representatives. You don't have any say in government. And that's why you could always, you always have the politicians running against Washington because people always feel disconnected from Washington politics. Why? Because they literally have no say in Washington politics. They only vote for the people who do have a say. So 
the genocide at Milos, the destruction of their navy, the end of the commercial empire, the end of the democracy, the bad leaders that led to the disastrous invasion of Sicily. The, the, the invasion of Sicily cost Athens 25% of its manpower. 25% of all the men who lived in the city. It's so bad that Euripides is going to write Lysistrata as the first anti-war work of art. It's an anti-war play. It's that war should end. We should not be fighting wars. Wars are bad. Nobody had written that before, really. The Assyrians loved war. The Babylonians write about war all the time. Gilgamesh, he hates death, but he loves war. He fights all the time. Athens becomes a university city. It stops being this commercial city. It stops being this military city, and it becomes a cultural hub of philosophy, of education. All right. So Sparta won. Athens lost. Greece is not united because the Spartans were not going to unite Greece. They, they, that was maybe an Athenian argument, but the Spartans were against uniting Greece. They want everyone to go back to being little city-states that all get along, and they trade, and they and they make money, and the Spartans get to run their little empire with their helot slaves, and everybody's happy, right? Yeah, no, no. In fact, the Thebans upset the Spartans pretty quickly, and the two of them got into fights because the Thebans were like, the Spartans were like, okay, we're in charge of Greece now, right? Everybody listen to us. And the Thebans were like, we did not get rid of Athens to be told what to do. We did not get the get rid of the mistress of Athens to be told what to do by the master of Sparta. No, 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 no. And in 470, E. Panamandas gets his democratic Theban army, marches down uh, into the Peloponnesus and smashes Sparta outside of Sparta. He frees the Helot Greek slaves. He ends Sparta as an economic military power. Sparta will technically, quote, exist for a while, but it's like a, it's like a, it's like a cosplay version. They keep their military. They keep their, like, barracks life, but there's no slaves to do the work anymore. So it's like cosplaying. Like, we're really tough Spartans. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Alexander doesn't even conquer Sparta. It's not worth his time. Thebes, he conquers. Sparta, pfft. he sends some other general down there. Antigonus, maybe. And Antigonus marches down and says, boo. And Sparta's like, okay, 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 okay. We're, we're, we're cool. Sorry. Like, so, and this is actually predicted in the end of Thucydides. In the end of Thucydides, there's a meeting with Alcibiades of Athens and Brasades, maybe? One of the leading Spartan generals. And, the, and, and Alcibiades asks, why are you fighting us? We're, we, we, have no, we, be, we have no beef with you. We have our little maritime empire. We're making money. We don't want to free your slaves. Like, why? what's your beef? And Brasades is like, you threaten all of us. One day, you may not want our slaves, but one day, your children's children will, and it's better to fight you now than to wait. And Alcibiades goes, but dude, do you understand that the only thing keeping you and your allies together is the hatred of us? That the moment they get, the moment you defeat us, you become the hated party? You become the number one enemy of everybody? Like, you're not ending war. This is not the war to end all wars. This is just the war to end Athenian wars. You're next. And that was, Alcibiades was totally right. Totally right. Thebes will crush Sparta, and Thebes will kind of take over as the leading state of Greece. So they changed Athens for Sparta, Sparta for Thebes, right? And this is where Philip II of Macedon comes in. Philip II of Macedon has a mill. Well, all of this craziness is going on in Greece. He's north of Greece. Macedonia, Macedon is where the mountains of Greece kind of level out into a plateau. And so it's good horse country. So the Macedonians were horse peoples. They weren't city folk. And so they're cousins to the Greeks. And they, 
and the Macedonians will say, hey, we're Greek, we're just like you. And the Greeks are always like, yeah, no, you're not really like us. Like, you may share our gods, kind of, but you're kind of like a combination of hillbillies and, like, weirdos. Like, if, if you want a good example of the way the Greeks thought about the Macedonians, watch The Water Boy. And um, Rob Schneider's character, who's the Cajun, who's like, rah, 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 and they're all like, yeah, exactly. Right? Um, that's the Macedonians. They're Macedonian. They're not Greek. But they kind of, they consider themselves to be Greek, like Greek cousins. And the Greeks are like, yeah, you're not. You're not like us. You're just not. You're weirdos. Well, north of Greece, they were always poor. They were always, and, and Athens or Sparta or the, could all, always get involved in Macedonian conflicts. They could hire, a, you know, a prince or a brother of the king to murder the king. And there's always like chaos going on up there, right? There's always the north. It's, you know, it's crazy up there. It's this frontier. And it's Macedon. It's Illyria. It's, there's craziness up there. There's these tribes and they're always fighting and, well, Philip II started a military revolution because Athens and Sparta and Thebes were all fighting each other. Nobody was interfering in his stuff anymore. And he had time to stabilize his kingdom, put himself in charge, and create a military revolution. And what they did was innovate on the phalanx. They made the phalanx longer, and they gave it a 22-foot spear instead of the 10-foot spear. That gave it more punching power when it moved forward. They also, since they had horses, put heavy cavalry on the sides. So now you didn't need a mountain or a river to protect the sides of a phalanx. You had men with spears and lances and swords that could do it. That means that the Macedonian phalanx was now offensive. Most phalanxes are actually defensive, the Spartan phalanx, the Athenian phalanx, they are good while they charge and they have their little fight. They're not going to invade Persia. They're not going to go and invade, you know, central Italy. They need mountains. They need rivers. They need a small area to fight in. Oh, with horses on the side, now the phalanx could be offensive. Now the phalanx could go out into a massive plain, a massive river plain. They could go to Babylon and win a battle. And so what Philip does is invade and conquer Greece in 338. He doesn't conquer like, like Sargon conquering everything. He kind of shows up, beats the Thebans, and says, I'm in charge. Who wants to fight me? And everyone else goes, you're cool. The Spartans have been crushed by the Thebans. The Athenians are a university town, you know, writing their poetry. So there's no one really to fight. And so they're like, you're cool, Philip. And Philip doesn't want to unify them. He doesn't want to mold them all together. He doesn't want to make the Macedonians. He just wants them to stop fighting so that he could do bigger things, beat up the Illyrians, and then invade the Persians. Okay, not a problem. Great, sure, you're cool. Macedon, you're the first state of Greece. Philip, you are a Greek super god. You're awesome. You're totally Greek, right? And Philip, the manliest man of the day, is murdered at his daughter's wedding by his ex-boy toy lover. Which teaches you, be good to your boy toys. Because if you're not, be good to your exes. Because if not, on the eve of the thing that you're going to do that's going to make you famous, you might be murdered by them. They might ruin your life right on the eve of you doing something awesome. And so the manliest man in Greece is murdered by his ex-boy toy, who stabbed him through his other good eye. Uh, Philip was famous. He's this big, grisly man who's been in many battles, and he's been wounded all over, and, and he had lost an eye. Because, you know, when the, when, the, when, the, when the spears hit each other, they smash, and the splinters everywhere, and, you know, he, he lost an eye. So he wore, you know, this, this, this eye patch, and he got stabbed through his one good eye. The boy toy got murdered uh, trying to flee. He got killed. He was most likely paid by the prince of uh, the king of Persia who did not want to get invaded and who had plenty of money. 
This left Alexander, the 18-year-old son of Philip, in charge. And what Alexander had to do was first gain legitimacy, because he's only 18, so he had to murder a couple of his uncles. He had to beat up the Illyrians. The Thebans revolt, because the Thebans are like, whoa, we're not going to be told what to do by an 18-year-old. He's the He's a teen. So he has to, he goes, he crushes the Illyrians and then hires them. He, he murders his uncles so that he's the only real heir. And he was the only real heir. Like there wasn't a serious, serious challenge, but Macedonian politics is Macedonian politics and you got to play the game. You know, you, you don't hate the players, you hate the game. And so you had to murder a couple of your uncles just to prove you were the guy. And he, he gets all this together. He gets his father's army to believe in him. And he marches down to Greece and he smashes the Thebans and then obliterates Thebes. He tears down Thebes. He murders the sacred band, a phalanx made completely of homosexual lovers. All 300 of them. Murders them all. <laughs> These are not men who ran away. In fact, the scene is famous for for Alexander crying and saying, with men like the, with 10,000 of these men, I could have conquered the world. It's such a waste to have to kill them. You know, so that's, so remember, that's how homosexuals were looked at in the ancient Greek world. They're not, you know, these effeminate caricatures that are going to be part of American comedy and uh, sitcoms of the late 20th century. You know, effeminate men who can't possibly, you know, defend even themselves with harsh words. You know, that's these are the manliest men in in Greece. And so, what does he do? He combines Greek culture with Mar- Macedonian military power, Illyrian allies, and he invades the Persian Empire. He conquers as far as the Indus River, four thousand miles away. He spreads Greek culture to the Middle East. He unleashes trillions of dollars in gold that the Persian kings were sitting on. It took 200 years. We can't, obviously, we can't know how much money was printed. We have thousands, tens of thousands of talents, but talents was like the income of a man for like like 20 years. It's like, how do you do that today? You know, and people will give you numbers and it's in the trillions, but it... The thing that you should know is it took 200 years for Greek kings to spend it all. And they spent it on cultural buildings. They spent it on culture, poetry, and writing. And they spent it on building programs, some of the wonders of the world, some of the most expensive things humans have ever built. And they spent it on war revolutions. So Lucas got 500 elephants from India. They built the pharaohs the Great Library, the Colossus of Rhodes, invented Hellenistic science, essentially inventing science. Not just Greek inquiry, but now something that looks like actual science, that you do stuff with chemistry, and you experiment with, and you make it, and you, 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 you know, it's not completely separate from alchemy. There's still a bit of alchemy in there, but it looks so much more like science than it ever did before. And these are the great wonders of the Hellenistic era. Greek culture conquers the world. So what was the state of the world after Alexander? Well, you have a wealthy, expansionary, cosmopolitan Greek universe led by three leading states, Macedonia, Egypt, Syria, Mesopotamia. Two of those should not surprise you. Egypt, this is Ptolemaic Egypt, the Egypt of Cleopatra a couple hundred years later. But Egypt is still one of the great powers. Mesopotamia, still one of the great powers, right? Babylon. So that's Seleucus, his Babylon, right? But notice Macedon. Now, Macedon shouldn't surprise you. It's surprising because it's new, but it's not new because what Macedon has simply done is replaced that other part of the triangle. When we started with Mesopotamia, it was the Hittites. And then... After the collapse of the Assyrians, it moved west to the Lydians. And now after the collapse of the Persians, it has moved west again to Macedon. Notice there's still that triangle of power in the Near East. What this did was Greek culture replaced Mesopotamian and Egyptian culture. The the culture of the East, of the Eastern Mediterranean, is going to be Greek now. 
for the next thousand years, 1500 years. Asia Minor becomes a Greek, Greek speaking, Greek living, urban country for 1500 years until the Turks show up. Greek citizens created states in Bactria, which is Afghanistan, 2,500 miles away. So Afghanistan was essentially a European country after Alexander came through. It was tied culturally, economically, philosophically to Greece. So the language of science and commerce, of war and government, of education, became Greek. And it will remain that way even after the Romans come through. It will remain that way until the Arabs conquer the Middle East and conquer North Africa. Thank you. Be safe.